Do you ever wonder how we can really know anything about the past with certainty? Emily asked, setting down her history textbook with a sigh. I mean, historians today claim to be objective and rigorous in their use of sources, but haven't people always believed their version of history was the authoritative truth? Her older brother Mark looked up from his laptop and smiled. Ah, pondering the epistemological foundations of history, are we? You're venturing into deep waters for a high school student. Don't patronize me, Emily retorted. I'm serious. How can we trust that anything we learn about history is actually true, and not just the biased perspective of whoever wrote it down? Mark leaned back in his chair, relishing the opportunity for an intellectual debate. Well, you're absolutely right that every telling of history unavoidably reflects the viewpoint of the historian. Pure objectivity is an illusion, but that doesn't mean the past is an unknowable void and all historical accounts are fictional. The pursuit of historical truth is still a worthy endeavor, even if that truth can only ever be partial and provisional. But hasn't the very notion of historical truth meant radically different things to people in different eras? Emily pressed. Like in ancient times, history was basically just a branch of rhetoric designed to convey moral lessons. Then, in the Enlightenment, it became a vehicle for grandiose theories about the progress of civilization. It's only relatively recently that historians have tried to turn it into an empirical, evidence-based field. True, but you could argue there's been a unifying thread amid all those shifting definitions of history, Mark countered. From Thucydides onward, the best historians have always grounded their accounts in scrupulous analysis of the best information available to them, whether that's eyewitness testimony, official documents, archaeological artifacts, or other records. The methods and standards of evidence have evolved, but the core aspiration to understand the reality of the past has endured. Emily pondered this. I can see that. So maybe the real question isn't, can we know the truth about history? But how do we adjudicate between competing historical narratives, all based on evidence but shaped by the historian's worldview and context? Like, a feminist scholar and a conservative Christian would probably interpret the same set of medieval records in very different ways. Now you're getting to the heart of the matter, Mark said approvingly. In my view, we'll never have one true history that commands universal assent. Historical knowledge advances through ongoing arguments between different interpretations. The job of the historian is to make a case for their particular interpretation as compellingly as possible, based on logic and evidence, while being transparent about their own perspective and values. Then the scholarly community and the broader public can judge which accounts seem most credible. Emily nodded slowly. So studying history is really an endless conversation, not a straight path to a single, unassailable set of facts. The pursuit of truth matters, but there will always be multiple valid ways of understanding the past. Exactly, and that's what makes it so endlessly fascinating. Hey, have you ever thought about majoring in history in college? I think you'd be a natural at it. Emily laughed. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. I still have to survive my AP Euro class first, but thanks for the vote of confidence and the mini history of historiography lesson. Anytime, Mark said warmly, I'm always happy to geek out about this stuff with you. Now, I should probably get back to my own work. This dissertation on the French Revolution won't write itself. As Mark turned back to his laptop, Emily flipped open her textbook again with renewed energy. Her conversation with her brother had crystallized something that had been bothering her for a while. The sense that history was more multifaceted and contentious than her curriculum sometimes led on. Armed with a more sophisticated understanding of how historical knowledge is constructed, she felt better equipped to critically engage with the narratives she encountered in school and in the wider world. History, she realized, would always be as much about the present as the past. Today's social and political realities shaped the questions scholars asked about earlier eras and the stories they wove from the archives. Some used history to reinforce the status quo, while others wielded it as a tool of dissent and advocacy for marginalized groups. The myth of the detached, omniscient historian flow aiding above the fray, simply reporting how it really was, had been punctured long ago. Every work of history was an intervention in the struggles and debates of its time. 
Yet this didn't mean Emily had to resign herself to a despairing relativism that treated all historical claims as equally groundless. As her brother had pointed out, some methods of investigating and interpreting the past were more credible than others. Careful use of evidence, logical argumentation, intellectual honesty, and openness to criticism were the vital ingredients of good history, even if they couldn't eliminate subjectivity entirely. Rather than acting as passive receptacles for unquestioned facts, responsible consumers of history had to weigh different accounts against each other and come to their own judgments, informed by an awareness of each author's agenda and background. History was a field of contestation, not a repository of settled truths. Newly attuned to these subtleties, Emily found herself reading her assigned chapters with a more discerning eye. When the textbook presented the emergence of European liberalism in the 19th century as an unalloyed triumph of progress, she recognized this as reflecting the author's implicit approval of market capitalism and individual rights. When a sidebar quoted a Cherokee leader criticizing President Andrew Jackson's Native American removal policies, she noted approvingly that indigenous perspectives were being included, but wondered how the passage would look different if written by a Cherokee historian rather than a well-meaning white scholar. No longer content to simply memorize names and dates, Emily started jotting down her own reflections and questions in the margins, eager to discuss them with her classmates and teacher. As the weeks went by, Emily's newfound enthusiasm for unraveling the complexities of the past began to spill over into conversations with friends and family. She found herself initiating discussions about everything from the legacy of colonialism to the cultural politics of historical commemoration. Not everyone appreciated having their assumptions challenged, but many were intrigued by Emily's knack for making history feel urgently relevant to the present. Privately, she started to daydream about continuing these intellectual adventures in college and maybe even beyond. Could the inquisitive high schooler who once doubted the very possibility of historical knowledge wind up producing it herself someday? The idea was exhilarating and daunting in equal measure. For now, though, Emily had more prosaic matters to attend to, like studying for her upcoming test on the Congress of Vienna. Armed with her new critical sensibilities, she dove into her review materials, not just to absorb the requisite information, but to probe for hidden assumptions and telling omissions. By the time she put down her pen, she was flush with the satisfaction of having rendered the familiar strange and the taken for granted newly open to question. However much the discipline of history had changed over the centuries, this much seemed constant. Its power to unsettle certainties, provoke fresh thinking, and enlarge our understanding of the human world in all its breathtaking diversity. Emily knew she still had a lot to learn, but she already grasped the most important lesson, that history is never finished, but always in motion, forever being remade through the passions and preoccupations of the present. Contributing to that unending quest for a more truthful reckoning with the past struck her as one of the worthiest callings imaginable. Her journey was just beginning,